This is DW News in Berlin. A year ago, our COVID-19 special went on air to help understand a frightening and baffling pandemic. All right, let's bring in our science correspondent, Derek Williams. But it's one that has a couple of very serious flaws. Back then, it was all about hand washing. Masks were rare in Europe. Today, they're essential, and we have vaccines. We didn't expect the COVID-19 special to still be on air a year on, but the pandemic is still here, and so are we. And it's been lockdown after lockdown, with another on its way here. I'm totally over it. I bet you are too. And no wonder, it's been a year since Germany officially classified the coronavirus as a pandemic. There are lots of lessons to be learned from this crisis. The biggest challenge being understanding how we perceive the dangers of a microscopic pathogen, how science progresses, and how politicians decide what's best for us. I've had to switch from business anchor to science journalist, not the easiest, tracking the ups and downs of a pandemic. What seemed far away suddenly became a painful reality here at the Webasto company in late January. One of their employees was the first German to contract COVID-19 from a colleague who had traveled from China. The German health minister remained optimistic. There is no cause for undue concern. A few weeks later, things looked quite different. Infections were spreading throughout Germany. In mid-March, the chancellor took the unusual step of addressing the nation on TV. It is serious. Please take it seriously too. There has not been any such challenge to our country since German unity. Not since World War II that has demanded such great joint solidarity-based action. Germany's first lockdown started. The streets of Berlin were virtually deserted. Museums and theatres had to close and the economy came to an almost complete standstill. Schools and nurseries also closed. The living room became the new classroom. But online teaching was difficult as laptops and software were scarce. Meanwhile, supplies of protective clothing in hospitals were running low. Doctors fought to keep people infected alive. By early May, nearly 7,000 of them had died. The high number was relatively low in comparison with other countries. Infection numbers started to fall. The lockdown worked. That reduced the burden on hospitals. Finally, summertime. Restrictions were eased. People returned to the streets. But the easing of measures brought new infections. By November, the numbers were so high that people were told to stay at home again. What became known as lockdown light began. For months, parts of the population had been protesting against the restrictions. But lockdown light wasn't enough. Shortly before Christmas, infection numbers reached such a high that public life was entirely shut down again, with alcohol bans in public and even nightly curfews in some places. By the end of the year, Germany's vaccination campaign had kicked off. Politicians promised that those who wanted the jab would be vaccinated by the end of summer. But many vaccination centers remain empty due to a shortage of doses. With the first rays of sunshine, many are now longing for more freedom. One year after the outbreak, restrictions are being lifted bit by bit. But in the meantime, mutations and infection numbers are rising again. Ulrich Dürnagel is a neurologist and founding director of the Quest Center for Transforming Biomedical Research. What was the biggest challenge for you as a scientist within this year? Well, uh, as a stroke researcher at the Charité, I would answer keeping our research going. I mean, laboratories were in shutdown or we worked under severely restricted conditions. Many of our technicians helping out in virus testing or the physicians were busy treating COVID patients. As someone trying to analyze and consequently trying to improve biomedical research at the Berlin Institute of Health, um, boy, this, this was a busy year kind of under a magnifying glass on, on how wonderful research is on the one hand, but also putting a spotlight on the many things we could do even better. So, so it's been a, a tough year, but uh, science and scientists have, have never been in the spotlight like they have been in this pandemic. Has that been good or bad for research? Well, 
Um, I, I think the pandemic has convinced even more people that science is the best thing we have. I mean, the, the key to progress and, and ultimately the only way to get out of, uh, us out of trouble, such as in a pandemic. Um, I think a good example of this is, is the changing sentiment against uh, vaccinations. I mean, we have, we have evidence that worldwide many anti-vaxxers are or have been converted and now opt to receive the jab. What about internationally? Um, I know Germany is a special case with a, a chancellor who's a scientist herself, but what about in other countries? Well, um, absolutely, but and, and I'm, I'm quite sure there are many national idiosyncrasies regarding the pandemic and how we're handling this, but, but this isn't one. I mean, I think appreciation of research and science in general appears to be on the rise. Was enough listening done to scientific evidence when it came to policy decisions? Were the right scientists listened to and um, at the end of the day were the scientists saying the right things and giving across the right messages? Uh, that's certainly an area in which we could have done better. Um, it's true that that in many countries, including Germany, I mean, you mentioned Merkel. I mean, scientists have the ear of uh, policymakers, and and in most countries claim uh, most countries claim that that their anti-corona measures are, are science-based. But uh, which scientific evidence delivered by whom led to which decisions generally remained completely opaque. I think it was intransparent, and, and one, of, uh, one, one may even argue that uh, evaluation, prioritization, and even uh, use of scientific evidence followed uh, political reckoning in, in many cases. So to, to paraphrase Darwin, I would say it was the survival of the ideas that fit. Yeah. So I, I think attributes of good scientific policy advice should, should be inclusiveness, rigorousness, transparency, and, and, and also accessibility. And, this is certainly not how we uh, how we saw it uh, over the last year. So, has the pandemic brought science closer to the people or divided society? Well, uh, currently societies are extremely polarized, and and that was certainly already true before Corona. But it may have uh, been even worsened. So, so. Um, I think science is being used on both sides of the fence. Scientific uh, findings often are contra contradictory or, or, or tentative, and uh, until better evidence weeds out previous uncertainties. Um, I think that, that this is a defining element of science and, and one of its major strengths even, and the way progress is made. Um, however, some turn this against science and, and they weaponize science. But importantly, I believe that in, in most cases, these people do not fundamentally distrust science. They, they, they just distrust politics and politicians and, and argue that they are using the wrong research results or make decisions without proper scientific basis. So tell me, as a scientist, what's your personal takeaway one year on in this pandemic? My personal take is that science uh, done right uh, as an international joint effort has again demonstrated its fantastic potential. But science during the pandemic could have done even better. I mean, we, we have completely failed to provide solid evidence, for example, through randomized controlled studies uh, regarding the usefulness and, and the efficacy of the various measures which uh, together make up what we call social distancing. So. Even after more than a year and millions of deaths worldwide, all this remains a black box uh, with which we are basically experimenting. So even, even though it's late in the game, I think we should start now. Uh, this, I fear, will not be the last pandemic we're facing. Ulrich Dernagel, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Well, one institution that really has suffered over the past year is the theatre. But the show must go on. The curtain went up again at the famous Berliner Ensemble on Friday, despite the rising COVID infections in Germany. Under strict hygiene conditions, the play Panic House was performed in front of about 350 guests. The audience had to test negative beforehand. Only every second seat was occupied and masks were compulsory during the entire performance. It's part of a pilot scheme in the capital featuring seven cultural venues to find the best way to stage events safely during the pandemic. Next on the program, a concert of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra is planned for around 1,000 visitors on Saturday. For the past year, DW has confined Derek Williams to his home study to answer your questions on the coronavirus. 
We've all had a chance to delve into Derek's mind and check out his bookshelf. So here he is again, like every day, except today's a little different. We had a question we wanted to ask Derek. How much time does Derek spend in front of his bookshelves every day? Strains and variants, variants and strains. Strains and variants. I want to leave behind all the speculation about blood clotting and, and the Astra... AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. So mixing and match <laughs> ridiculous. Symptomatic and Informative as ever. Derek's usually a little more eloquent than that. I'm Ben Fazulan. Thanks for watching. It's been really nice having you here the past year. I hope you keep joining us. And obviously, the show's going to be going on for a bit longer. Stay safe. See you again soon.